Scott said something to you about the budget. I don't know why he needed to say that about you not reading the budget during the sermon. I kind of figure that if you're the kind of person that would prefer to look at the budget rather than listen to the sermon, it really doesn't say much about you spiritually as much as it does about you mentally. I've just really got some concerns about somebody really be spending time doing that. But I do hope that you'll look at that budget and come prepared next Sunday night um, if you've got questions and then we'll... Um, That will be proposed, and then we'll be voted on that budget then. So that is important for us in the life of the church and the things that we're about. It is important, if we are going to be the church, that we understand what it means to be the church. We've been talking about being a great church, and I want you to understand if we're going to be a great church, then it's especially important that we understand what it means to be the church. I'm grateful to God that he has given us so many uh, metaphors in the scripture that helps us understand. Last week we looked at one of those, being the body of Christ. This morning I want us to think about being the family of God. And, And to think about that, I want to draw your attention to what John the Apostle wrote in his gospel in that first chapter. If you'd stand with me, we might honor the reading of God's word. I just want to read these two verses together. But as many as received him, speaking of Jesus, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. <clears throat> to those born, to those who, are, who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God, we ask that you would bless not only the, the reading of your word, but also the preaching of your word this morning as we seek to understand what it means to be your family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We become the children of God by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives. If we're the children of God, that means that God is our Father. And this morning what I want you to think about with me is the fact that if God is our Father, then we are members of His family. We are members of the family of God because of Jesus Christ. But it's also important for us to point out that if we're members of the family of God, that means that we are also brothers and sisters in Christ, united in Christ and united under His Lordship over our lives. But we're family. Lord Nelson wrote a dispatch after one of his great naval victories in which he attributed his great victory to the fact that he had the happy privilege to command a band of brothers. I'm convinced that's what Jesus wants his church to be. He wants us to be a band of brothers and sisters united under his lordship over our lives. So if God is your father and if God is my father, then we're members of his family. And if we're members of a family, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we our family. And one of the places where that was used in Scripture, that metaphor is used, is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And there Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. The house of God. Notice that phrase, the house of God. Literally, that is the household of God. When you talk about a household, you're talking about a family. And so literally that could be either translated the household of God or the family of God. And so that we might not misunderstand what Paul is referring to there. He goes on to say, this is the church of the living God. Again, a reminder to you and I that we are the family of God. And if a church is to be a family, that suggests that we ought to be uh, one of the uh, closest, warmest kinds of fellowship, a a loving and caring fellowship. Uh, We ought to be a place of loving and accepting Fellowship, uh, where people who are born again can be nurtured to maturity in Christ Jesus. But I need to point out to you something, that one enters the family of God only by a spiritual birth. 
through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what John was letting us know. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. It's the only way we can be born into the family of God. Jesus described it that way when in chapter 3 he talked about the transformation that takes place in a person's life by the working of the Holy Spirit when he said that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So that just as a child is physically born into a physical family, so a child of God is born into, is born spiritually into a spiritual family. As you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, the Holy Spirit does a work of transformation. Jesus says it's like being born again. You're brand new, but you're born into a family, God's family. John didn't want us to miss that out. So before Jesus said those words in his prologue, he reminded us, as many as received him, to them he gave the, the right to become the children of God. Just to say it again, you cannot become a member of the church apart from faith in Jesus Christ. It's through faith in Jesus Christ that you're now born into the life of the church, the spiritual family of God. You can walk the aisle, you can get baptized, we can put your name on the church membership roll, but that does not obligate God to honor you as a member of the church or of his family. But when you repent of your sins and you trust what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary, dying in your place, when you trust what he did there and understand that was sufficient to cover all your sin and you turn away from your sin and you turn in faith to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, you're born again. And that's how you enter the family of God. But now as the family of God, there's some things that ought to describe who we are. As the family of God, we are to be a people of gladness. Stop and think about what one characteristic, if I were to ask you, what one characteristic would you want to characterize your family, I believe if we did a survey, the one word that would come up more than any other is that we'd be a happy place. We want a, we want a happy family. As a matter of fact, we even talk about that, don't we? You know, happy wife, happy life, you know. <laughs> if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, okay. We, we want a happy life. We want a happy fi family, don't we? We want that to be true. But it's not just, all, not just it depends on what mama, how mama's feeling. It, it depends on how all of us are feeling. That, that we be a place where we, we really enjoy coming and being and joining. When I was a preschooler growing up, I remember going to church. And the very first passage of scripture that I have any recollection of remembering is Psalm 122 verse 1. Where the psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I understood, and I now understand what my, my, they called them beginners back then. My beginner's teacher was trying to get me to understand that, that the church ought to be a place where I want to go. That I, that I look forward to going. And I am so glad that the churches that I've been a part of all my life have always been just like that. That I, that I wanted to go, I wanted to be there. My, my friends were there, uh, the teachers there, they loved and cared about me. And they made it a place where I wanted to be. Now that doesn't mean that everything was always perfect. There were some difficult times, especially in the church that I grew up most of my life in before, uh, um, before I left home. Uh, there was a time in which the church actually split over a pastor. And that pastor eventually left, and a new pastor came in. And those were some hard days. But you know what? It didn't deter me from wanting to go there and being with my family of faith. I loved those people. They loved me. They encouraged me. It was there that I felt called into ministry. And guess what? It's because of that family of faith that I continued along that path until I got to, to college uh, they, they encouraged me and I went to Stetson University specifically because it was a Baptist school and, and I would get the kind of education there that I would need to prepare me for seminary. But, but that church family encouraged me all along the way. 
when you think about a family, there's some characteristics that are important if a family is going to be a happy family. You know, there ought to be love. There ought to be care. There ought to be acceptance. And there ought to be respect. And, you know, if all those things are there, it's going to be a good place. But I want to suggest to you there's some other words that you might not think about it immediately. There ought to be discipline. There also ought to be responsibility. You know, if, if people just do whatever they want to do and, and, and they don't care how it affects anybody else, I promise you that will not make for a happy family. But where people know their responsibilities and are fulfilling those responsibilities, when they have the disciplines to say yes to the right things and the discipline to say no to the, to the wrong things, that makes for a happy family. And that's true in a church as well. So there's a place here where there's people who love and care about you, accept you, but also will hold you accountable and hold you responsible uh, for the things that go on. Just think about it Sunday morning. Shame, there's Teresa, she is here this morning. She, she can vouch for this. Um, she gets here on Sunday morning and finds out that two or three of her, of her children's workers that morning have not shown up. Didn't bother to call, didn't call it, and, and didn't bother to get somebody to replace her. That makes for a happy morning for you, doesn't it? No, just far from, far from it. it. That really, you see what I'm saying? Just that responsibility aspect of it. But there's something else about this place. This really needs to be a place where you want to come. And, and you can't wait to get here. You remember the theme song for the 1980s uh, sitcom, Cheers? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. Sadly, that's talking about a pub or a bar. It ought to be talking about the church. And that'll be true of this church. That you want to come here because people know you. Now, you don't know everybody in this room. I, I, I know that, but you know their faces and you recognize their faces. But I hope you at least know the names of the people that sit around you Sunday by Sunday even if you don't go to life group together. But that's one of the good reasons to go to life group. You get to know each other. And, and it really helps to bond the family together. And you begin to feel more like you belong when you have those people who know you and know your name. And, and they look at you and they say, I'm glad you're here today. And then you can say, and I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If, if, if we're going to be the family of God, then we've got to be a people of gladness, a people of happiness. You know, as the family of God, we're also to be a people of nurturing and growth. God's plan, a man and a woman would come together in love and marry one another. And as a result of their union, children will be born and come into this world. Now, the way it happens in America today it didn't always happen like this. In earlier generations, it was different. But in the generation that I, was, that I grew up in, I was born in a hospital. And my mom and my dad, they took me home. And there they took on the responsibility of, of nurturing and caring for me for the next 18 to 20 plus years. And, and that happens in all families. And that's, that's part of God's design. That's the way God planned it, that it would happen that way. But just imagine for a moment that when mom and dad brought me home from the hospital, they, they would take me out and put me on the front steps of the, of the house that we lived in there and said, Mike, we're so glad that you came into the world. We really are excited that you're now part of our family. Come back and see us now sometime. I wouldn't be standing here today, would I? And, and somebody said, well, that would be irresponsible. Somebody else would say, that'd be criminal, and they'd both be right. Because that's not God's plan and God's design. God's design is that we pour into one another and help one another grow, and, and, and that's what the family is supposed to be. It's a place of acceptance where we can grow. Now, one of the favorite pastimes of sinners outside the church is to criticize the sinners inside the church. Because they say that, well, we're hypocrites. You know the, where the word came from. It came out of the Greek theater. Uh, the actor uh, was called a hypocrite. 
It, it, it didn't have the meaning that it has right now. It, it just He was a play actor. That's what the, name, what the name was. What he would do is he would wear a mask, and he would change the mask depending on what player he played, I mean personality he played in the play. And, and he might have three or four masks and play different roles there. You know, one man, one man of theater, if you will. But usually it may be about two or three, but you could do a whole play with just two or three people. They just change masks so you know who's who, what character they're playing. But the word began to be talking about somebody who's two-faced. Somebody who's just pretending to be something. Normally trying to get you to think that there's something they're not for their own personal gain. For, for your approval. When that's really not who, who they really were. Now, I, I am confident that there are hypocrites in the church. Sadly, I have to confess that. But I'm not con convinced that everybody that the world says is a hypocrite is a hypocrite. Because, you see, some of those individuals that the world might say, that's a hypocrite, not really are. They're just new believers. They haven't yet learned to what their profession, how their lifestyle needs to match the profession of faith. They're, they're in that process. Some of them are immature. They, they, they've not grown up for a variety of reasons. Some their own fault, some the fault of the church. Some of them are, are just weak believers. But here's the thing. We don't throw them out. If we're doing what we're supposed to do, we continue to accept them where they are. You know, it's like in a family. In a family, you've got people at various levels of maturity. You've got adults. You've got teenagers. You've got school-aged children. You've got preschoolers. Now, something I want to tell you about adults, I expect adults to act like adults. I really hope that in your family, all the adults act like adults and they don't act like preschoolers. Teenagers. I expect teenagers to act like teenagers. That may drive you crazy, but that's just what teenagers are. But I expect them to act like teenagers and not like preschoolers. And I don't expect them necessarily to act like adults. I want them to grow to adulthood, but when they don't act like an adult, I understand they're teenagers. This is how teenagers act, okay? John, when writing his first epistle, wrote and says, I write to you children. And then he went on to say, I write to you young men and I write to you fathers. And what he was doing is acknowledging that in the life of the church, there are people at different spiritual levels of maturity. And he just recognized each and every one for, for who they are. If we're going to be the church, then we must understand that there are people that are not going to be at the level of maturity that maybe we are or at the level of maturity that we wish they were. But that doesn't mean that we cut and run on each other. It means all the different, just the opposite. It means it's time to just hunker down and really begin to start investing in one another's life and accepting one another because we are a place of nurturing and growth. We are a nurturing community where we accept people where they are and encourage them to grow. Like the old statement was, we'll accept you as you are, but we're going to love you too much to leave you as you, you are. We want to see you grow to become all that you can be, possibly be, to become the very best follower of Jesus Christ that you can possibly be in this life and in this world. And so when we gather for worship, when we gather for fellowship, when we gather for instruction, when we gather for training, when we gather to witness and to serve in this world, all those are opportunities intended to help us to grow and to grow spiritually. Because the church does not only grow by addition, it also grows by maturation. And if we're going to be the kind of family of faith that we need to be, we need to be that kind of, provide that kind of environment that both encourages and enables one another to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews put it this way, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Do you notice some phrases in there? Let us consider one another. Let us exhort or encourage one another. That is one, those are two of the about 30 different places where that term one another is used. 
where in the New Testament we're called to love one another, to accept one another, to respect one another, to honor one another, to rejoice with one another, to weep with one another, and on and on we go some 30 different ways. They're not there by accident. I believe it's God's one another principle that He wants us to apply in the life of the church, that we would take each and every one of those, take each and every one seriously, apply each and every one of them to our own lives as we relate to one another in the life of the church, and, and that would help us to be the community of nurturing and growth that God intends for us to be. Because we are a family. That's what a family does. A mom and a dad. And we take responsibility for one another in the life of the family. The African proverb says it takes a whole village to raise a child. Well, the truth of the matter is it takes a whole church to help a new believer, or any believer for that matter, grow to become what we ought to be in Christ Jesus. Let's love one another. Let's accept one another. Let's respect one another. Let's honor one another. Let's weep with one another. Let's rejoice with one another. Let's be a church of maturity and growth as we nurture one another. Finally, as a family of God, we're also to be a people of grace. If we're going to truly be the, the church, that's what we have to be. We preach grace, but we also need to practice grace. Robert Frost, Frost once wrote, Home is the place where when you go there, they have to take you in. I should, say, should have said, called it something you haven't deserved. Something you haven't deserved. Whatever the home is, it's the place that you haven't deserved. Whatever your earthly family ought to be, it's that place that you haven't deserved. So let me ask you a question. What did you do, you, I'm talking about you specifically, what did you do to become a member of your family? What did you do? Somebody says, well, I, I was born. No, you, you didn't do that. Your mother gave birth to you. Your parents conceived you, but you didn't do a thing. Do you realize that? That's, called a, that's all a matter of grace. And, and, and if we'll understand it that way, it'll be a greatest, one of the greatest blessings and perspectives for us to carry that I'm in this family because of God's grace. I was born to this mom and to this dad because of God's grace. That was God's grace in my life. And, and I know that for sure because my mom and my dad both loved Jesus and brought me up to love Jesus and it was a matter of God's grace. I don't know where I'd be today if I wasn't born into a Christian family. I w I'm not a Christian because I was born into a Christian family, but, but it surely paved the way to help me to understand what I needed. You are in the story of the prodigal son? You know the story. There's a father who has two sons. The younger of the two sons demands his share of the inheritance. He goes out and he wastes it to the point that he has absolutely nothing. He's working in a pig pen. He's so hungry he would gladly eat the food the pigs were eating. And then he comes to himself. And he says, you know what? My, my father's slaves are doing better than I am. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to beg my father to take me back as a slave. He goes back. Something unique has happened. But he's still a long way away. His father sees him coming, which suggests what? Father was looking for him. He, he, he was longing for his son's return. When the father sees him, he does something amazing. He runs. You need to understand in that day and time that Jesus lived, respectable older men did not run anywhere. People ran to them, but they didn't run to anybody. <laughs> this father just forgets all about it, all dignity, just throws it all away, and he starts running to his son. And his son begins to start to his speech, but he can't finish it because his father has picked him up, grabbed him in his arms, and says, bring a robe here and put it on my boy. Get some shoes on his feet. Put rings on his fingers. What he's doing is saying, he's back in the family. 
not, not as a slave, but as a full-fledged son with all the rights and privileges thereof. His brother, the, the, the older brother of the, of the man, sees what's going on and begins to resent his father for the grace he's showing to his brother because he didn't get it that family, home, is a place you haven't to deserve. It's all about grace. And that's how we live together. Marilyn and I celebrated 44 years of marriage this past June. And one of the things that has made those 44 years happy years is the fact that we understand some things about grace. We believe that God brought us together by His grace. We didn't deserve each other. God gave us to each other just the same. And there's sometimes when I don't deserve Marilyn's love because I'm not perfect. She's not either. But we've learned to forgive each other, to, make a, to be patient with one another, and to keep on loving one another because we understand that God, by His grace, has done that to us. And that's what we have to do with one another. And that one word, grace, has made it, such, made it possible that we can talk about having a happy marriage and a growing marriage. Because apart from that grace that God has given us, that, now, that was enabled us to give to one another, we I don't know that we'd be married 44 years down the road. You see, if our church is to be a family, that's what we have to be like. We ought to be a place of grace. People are going to upset you. People are going to offend you. In the church. I, I know that's a, a hard for you to believe because this is such a perfect church right here. Oh, don't we wish. Yeah, it's going to happen. And I see people, they, they get mad and they pick up their, 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 their ball and bat and they go home and they never come back to church. They're not going to that church anymore. And they start looking for the perfect church. Chuck Cassidy told me this past week about a, a, a pastor that he knew that a young man that was coming to that church, he asked him, he said, you haven't joined yet. Why haven't you joined? And the young man said, because I'm looking for the perfect church. I haven't found it yet. And the pastor said, well, if you ever find it, do that church a favor, don't join, you'll ruin it <laughs> because you're not perfect. And we have to understand that. You know, it's, it's amazing. When you mess up, you expect to receive grace. So what do you do when other people around you mess up? I mean, if you expect it, don't you think that you owe it to them? What is that that Jesus taught us? As you would that men should do unto you, do you even so to them. You would want them to offer you grace. You need to offer grace. See, that's what allows the church to be a place of hope and healing and affirmation. And you can be a part of this church. And you say, but pastor, you just said it about me. I'm not perfect. That's all right. None of us are. And that's what makes this the family of God. We're not perfect, but we're forgiven by God's grace. The last invitation in the book of the Bible. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The Lord says, come, come freely. And that's what we must say to one another and to a world around us. And by grace, we get to do that. But sadly, sometimes the most critical, caustic, and judgmental people in all the world are found in the life of the church. As a result of that, someone says that the church is the, uh, the, the, the Christian army, rather, is the only army that shoots its wounded. The next time you're tempted 
to shoot a wounded believer? Let, let me remind you, if we shot every wounded believer, there'd be no believers because we're all wounded. We all need grace. You know what? I would prefer to be a place of grace. Not because you need it to be a place of grace, because I need it to be a place of grace. I, I would rather be a place of grace. I, I would rather for, uh, for us to be a place where you don't have to deserve to belong, because none of us deserve to belong. I prefer that we be a family, that we be the family of God. An older lady was dying. She called for her nephew. He and she had a special relationship. But he had left the church. And as a result, he had left God. I hope you realize people who leave the church never drift toward God. They always drift away from him. But he had gotten that way. And so she called him back and she said to him, Boy, hang on to your church. For when the chips are down, they'll hold on to you. That's a good word. That's who we're to be. We're the kind of people that could stand alongside each other, encourage one another, support one another, be there for one another, so that when the chips are down, we can lift each other up. Because that's what it means to be family. Especially to be the family of God. Eventually everything in your life is going to be stripped away from you. Every relationship in life, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your family, your children, your friends, everything's going to be stripped away save one thing, and that's your relationship with God. That's something the world cannot take away from you. Oh, and there's something else. Your relationship with the family of faith that's eternal. You see, when you're a member of God's family, you have a forever family. And if we're the church that God wants us to be, that's exactly what we'll be. Forever family. Daniel's leaving tomorrow to go to Washington and he'll become a staff member at the Westwood Baptist Church in Olympia, Washington. But Daniel, you're still family. So Daniel, you're welcome back anytime. There's some folks that left. They left in a huff. Sometimes they come to themselves and they come back. You know how we're to treat them? As if they never left. Because we're a place of grace. And we're a fa place of fa and, and we're family. And that's what we're supposed to be like. Doesn't mean we don't we put up with anything and everything. Doesn't mean we don't hold on to each other accountable. Doesn't mean there's not discipline. But it does mean there's love and there's acceptance and there's grace for those who will receive it. I remind you again, but to all who believed in him, that is in Jesus, and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Social scientists have been telling us for years that one of the signs of a happy family, one of the characteristics of a happy family is the family gather together regularly for meals together. That's the home I grew up in. I was expected to be at supper at supper time. Sunday lunch. That's the home that Marilyn built. She provided, cooked supper every night and we sat down for a meal every night and with rare exceptions, you were expected to be there when supper time came. And it made for us to have a happy and healthy home. It's interesting, when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, He gave them a meal. They call it Passover. Do you know how they observed that meal? As a family. The family gets together. And the father conducts the mealtime uh, as they take the different elements that, that were part of the, of the Passover meal. And Jesus, before he left this earth, gave us a meal. 
And this is our meal. We call it the Lord's Supper or communion. Some call it Eucharist. But it's all the same thing. It, it, it's that which makes and reminds us that we're family. As we stop to remember, our Lord Jesus loved each and every one of us so much that he laid down his life for us. He allowed his body to be broken for us and his blood to be poured out for us. And then he gave us this meal and he said, take this bread and take this cup. And as you do so, you remember me. You know what? This is a time for us as family to celebrate the fact that we're family. And to celebrate the one who made it possible that we could be family. And to not take lightly what he did to make us family. When you understand what it cost Jesus Christ to remove all the walls that separated us and kept us from being family, you'll do all you can to make sure those walls stay torn down and never get re-erected re again. Because it cost him his life. But he loved you and he loved me so much. He not only wanted us to be reconciled to our Heavenly Father, he wanted us to be reconciled to one another. To the point that on the night before he was crucified, if you go to John chapter 17, you'll see that he prayed for you and me. And what did he pray? That we might be one. It was just another way of saying that we might be family. If you have your elements there, let me encourage you right now. As we remember the night before he was crucified, he gathered his disciples and he took the bread and he broke it and he passed it among them. Take that for a moment. And before we partake of that, would you just focus on what Jesus has done for you? And Jesus took that bread and he broke it and he passed it to his disciples. He said, take this and eat it. And as you do so, remember this is my body which is broken for you. And so do this in remembrance of me. He also took the cup. As he passed it out, he reminded them, this is my blood which is shed for you. Would you stop and remember what Christ has done for you? Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. We can go back to that slide that had the, the last slide that showed um, John 1, 12 and 13. The very last slide there. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. If you've yet to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's no greater need that you have in your life. 
You can't be born into the family of God apart from faith in Jesus Christ. You can't be a part of God's forever family without Jesus Christ. It, it all centers in Him, in who He is and what He's done. And if you need to receive Him this morning, I'll be standing here. You can come and share that with me. It may be that you are a believer, but you've been disconnected from a family. But you believe God's calling you to be a part of, of this family of faith. I invite you to come during this time and present yourself for membership. We want to rejoice in what God's doing in your life. There may be other things that God's calling you to do that you need to do this morning and you need to do in a public way. And again, we want to rejoice with you in your obedience and also in God's grace and what He's doing in your life. And so I invite you to come, however God's speaking to your heart, that we might celebrate together what God's doing. Let's stand together.